Okay, welcome. My name is Jim Barker and I'm the founder of Fixing Her Eyes. Anytime we gather, it's important for us to acknowledge country and I thank Common Grace for their help and advocacy in this space. I'll also be linking later to their excellent safer resources around domestic and family violence, which Erica Hammonds and her team have worked painstakingly on. We are gathering this evening on different lands. I would like to acknowledge the Darug people, the traditional custodians of the land on which this online gathering is hosted today. The traditional custodians are caretakers on behalf of our almighty creator. We would also like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and future or emerging. We acknowledge all Aboriginal peoples present with us online and that the Indigenous peoples of Australia were this nation's first theologians and teachers. This evening is the final of our Fixing Our Eyes conversation sessions on headship. We've learned this week that there is solid and credible evidence that there is no case for male headship in the church and in marriages. Yet male headship is a non-negotiable part of many churches' belief systems. We've heard that the doctrine of headship is a distortion of the gospel message of mutual love and respect. Biblical submission is mutual between husband and wife. Submission, as we heard from Mark Moscow last night, is best described as humility, not obedience or deference. We must read all of Ephesians and never start teaching from chapter 5, verse 22, and leave chapter 5, verse 21 out of our teaching from the pulpit or in Bible study settings. The conversation about this damaging interpretation of the Bible needs to be held. We have previously shared testimonies of women sharing how it can lead to unsafe marriages and homes. The doctrine of headship has also been used to keep women out of leadership within the church. This doctrine limits women from using their spiritual gifts, which in turn limits the work of the church. We are concerned that the collective church isn't doing the work in the world that it should be as a result. And on Monday night, we heard from the Reverend Melissa Lipset, who said, I think what disappoints me terribly is that this should have been the church's moment in history. The world is starting now to wake up to equality and what does equality mean? Equality in terms of gender and greater diversity around that and the church and around the equality of men and women. Society and community should have been able to look at the church and we should have been able to say, yes, look to us. We've got the biblical mandate for this. We know how to do this. Look at how well we do this. Look at how well we do mutual flourishing. But in actual fact, we have it so badly wrong, even with that biblical mandate, that not only is the world not looking at us for the answer, but the world is actually looking at us and saying, well, you're irrelevant to the conversation because you're so far behind where society and community is and is thinking with this. This deeply grieves me. I'm speaking here as Melissa and a lot of us on Fixing Our Eyes, and I'm quite sure it deeply grieves God because we are his plan A. And this should have been the church's moment in history, but it's not. And a verse that's come to mind this week is Matthew 5, 14 to 16, which says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others and they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. Now tonight I'm thrilled to have the panel that we have of people who put that verse into practice. And I'm just thrilled to have Kylie Maddox Pigeon, the Reverend Angela Peverell, Dr. Jackie Service, Dr. Julia Baird, and the Reverend Dr. Jeff Broughton with us this evening. Thank you so much for your time, your wisdom and your heart. Now I'm gonna start with Kylie, you're at the top of my screen. Kylie, you have an upcoming chapter in the third edition of Discovering Biblical Equality, Perspective on Whether Equal But Different Is Really Equal At All. And as a psychologist, you've counselled women who have experienced domestic violence. Kylie, we're just going to go straight to it. Sure. We've heard theological perspectives, but from a social science and a psychology perspective, is male headship problematic? Short answer, yes. Um, so male headship isn't the only cause of domestic and family violence, but there are a number of really obvious parallels and male headship creates fertile ground for domestic and family violence. Um, so complementarians are quick to say that it's only when the doctrine is distorted that it can cause a problem, but the doctrine itself is harmful. 
partly because it's oppressive and discriminatory to women, partly because it empowers perpetrators, um, but for other reasons too, like the bias it creates, and I can talk a bit more about that. Um, the main rebuttal I, I hear against male headship is that when it's done in loving kindness, mm. that it makes it okay and it means that women can flourish. But I, I just don't think that's true because we don't have any evidence for that. We have a bunch of evidence that says that it's harmful. Mm. And I don't know of any evidence, please tell me if you know of any, drop it in yeah. the comments that says that it's helpful. Um, and I, I think that's probably because the system is unjust. Having male headship, is, male headship is really obviously unjust to women. So just being kind, just saying that you have, you know, that you enact that headship with loving service isn't enough because the system is unjust. You have to overturn the unjust system. Um, like when Jesus overturned the tables at the temple, mm. he didn't just pass through that unjust system and be nice to everybody. He overturned the system. Or you could say the same for being a slave owner. Being a slave owner who's kind to your slaves is not enough. You have to overturn the unjust system. What great parallels, yeah. Well, yeah, so I think male headship is inherently harmful even if you do it in a manner of loving service. Um, it's harmful because men are given permanent unilateral authority over their mm -hmm. wife or women or children without skill, gifting, expertise, capability, mm -hmm. accountability, um, which is obviously unfair for so many reasons. It uh, puts clear barriers around the safety. Well, it's a barrier to the safety for women. Um, it presents risks to women's participation and women's voice. And whether women are treated badly or well just kind of relies on the choice of that man in power that sinful man, I might add, without checks mm -hmm. and balances. Um, Gosh, that's so helpful. What a good way to start this evening. And, and please, it's, this is a conversation, so if there's other people who would like to um, add to the conversation that um, Kylie has started there, please feel free to just jump in at any time. I know Kylie, yeah. no one's going to mind. No, please, I could talk for a long time, so you probably have to jump in. Um, so, good, good, Julia. You I... <laughs> you no, know, I was... <laughs> I just think the point that you're making there about it not being a twisting is such an important one in terms of where we're at now in the public debate. Um, and I just, if, um, do you mind, Jen, if I just, no, no, do you mind if I just ask Jack what, what, how you respond to that? Because, um, yeah, because that's, that's what we're, we're what, that's, that's probably the sticking point right now. Could this doctrine in itself be problematic if it upholds a system in which women are excluded or silenced, as um, Kylie is saying? Or can you maintain the argument that it's a twisting? Who's twisting? You're asking me. Is that all right, Jen? Okay. Go for it. Thought if we could explore. Is that all right? <laughs> That's all right with Jeff. The drum of the host takes over. No, <laughs> no, no, she's not. Not. <laughs> she's That's absolutely fine. not. I've told uh, her to. Um, so I should say at the beginning that uh, I've not held what the diocese would maintain and practice for more than 20 years. So a lot of these debates are actually pretty stale for me. I kind of resolved a lot of this when I was studying overseas in the mid-90s. But to your question, Julia, um, yeah, I think, Kylie's point, I think it is an unjust system. And, you know, I felt you feel that particularly at Synod, where all the rectors are male and a vast majority of the lay reps are male. There are a lot of women there, but it's be running, I don't know what the exact stats are on my time on Synod, but yeah. be three it's to six. one. Yeah. Be three to one. And they are deciding things like we're not going to talk about this. So that mm -hmm. just, like, it's hard to see that how that's a fair, in any way, a fair kind of system. So I so said at really obvious levels like that, and then you go down into the practice in churches where clearly gifted and uh, talented and trained women 
even women with PhDs in theology, are mm. prevented from preaching. Uh, and very inexperienced, untrained blokes are allowed. Now, I know that's not across the whole diocese, but that does happen to down to the level that Kylie's really talking about in the domestic situation uh, where there are no checks and balances. Um, one of my, I guess, uh, particularly in the reporting started a few years ago, where are the men who are calling the men to account? Like in this system, if you believe it's true, uh, that there's male headship, that where are the men who are calling the men who are abusers to account? And it just doesn't happen or certainly doesn't happen enough. So for all those reasons, I'd agree, the system is unjust. And there's a number of parallels between male headship theology and domestic violence. It, it's not too much of a leap to go between the two. Um, so the parallels exist in lack of gender equality, which is obvious in the complementarian, complementarian church. That's what it is by design. And all the bodies that research domestic violence say that the primary driver of domestic violence is gender inequality. Mm. So that's the primary driver, <clears throat> excuse me, gender inequality. They wouldn't agree with you on that, though. They would say men and women are equal. They just have differing roles, differing function. Yep. So you need to actually, so it's not necessarily the correct framing of the argument to say that, well, they're saying they're not equal. They're, that's the how it's framed, equal but um, functionally different. Equal but different. Right. Mm. And the, <laughs> the social science research is very, very clear. There's an enormous body of research that says it's not equal. You can't claim equality while being restricted in opportunity, voice and participation. That's the definition of unequal. Exactly. Um, and there's so many other things that come into play like uh, unconscious bias where the people you see doing something more often you believe to be superior at it. Regardless of whether you have a conscious belief whether they're superior or not, you can say that you think men and women are equal, but if you see men more often in roles of preaching, public office, ministry, et cetera, you'll have an unconscious bias that men are more capable. Um, conscious bias where you would say that women are restricted from holding um, public you know, roles of ministry and influence. That's a conscious bias and a lot of comps are quite happy to hold that bias. There's affinity bias. There's a bunch of other stuff. So all the social science research says that it's not equal. I mean, that's pretty obvious to me, but a lot of people still claim that you can have, what do they call it? Equality in personhood and dignity, but differing roles. Mm. Um, I think as soon as you put a but after equal, you're actually saying unequal. Yeah, there's some gymnastics going on there. There's a lot of gymnastics, and it's really obvious to people that research. Behavioural economics is the school that looks into this. Iris Bonnet is brilliant, B-O-H-N-E-T. So she'll, um, you know, she's the primary researcher and all this sort of stuff. Um, there's my son. Hi. Uh, hello. <laughs> um, so, yeah, if anyone's got any evidence that male headship is actually helpful and beneficial and helps women to flourish, I'd love to see it because... The evidence, all of the evidence that I've seen says exactly the opposite. Thank you, Kylie. I think that's so good to have you with us because you're on the ground. You're hearing directly from women. You're not only are you trained from a theology perspective, but you're a trained psychologist. And I think we have to listen to experts in this field. And so thank you so much for your insights um, where all those areas just come together um, so well and so helpful. I'm going to bring Angela into this conversation. So you're a priest um, in charge of the parish of Musselbrook in the upper Hunter region of New South Wales, but you worshipped in Sydney Anglican churches throughout your younger years and you wrestled knowing you were called to ministry life, but you couldn't find your place. Now, recently it's been said by quite a prominent Christian leader in the Anglican church that we would be surprised how infrequently this male headship is spoken of from the pulpit. To be fair, he said that he regrets saying it, but for many women it hit a nerve as they know that the headship structure permeates every single aspect of the church gathering and, and beyond, not just the church gathering, but in a day in, day out part of their lives. What damage have you seen male headship theology have and what alternatives do you see from your reading of the Bible? 
Well, the number one damage is on a woman's self-esteem, how she sees herself both in God's eyes and in other humans' eyes. Um, if I relate my own story, I was actually 55 when I was actually fully able to live into my calling. And in fact, as I realised my calling, I understood my obedience to God was to fulfil that vocation not to keep pushing God back and say no. So um, to deny a woman the ability to actually live into her um, full identity as a child of God, it's just, it's just destroying. Um, that's at that level. But if you go to the next level where um, a woman feels subordinate in a marriage or in other relationships. Um, she is then denied a voice. She's denied mm. the ability to flourish as a human being. Um, in some of the marriages where I have pastored women who were held in a subordinate relationship, um, they're denied the ability to earn an income. They're held hostage to the family to be able to serve, to serve and particularly in clergy marriages, to serve the needs of the husband and, and his need to be out there caring for his flock and proclaiming the gospel. But what is she left with is purely to care for her children. There's nothing wrong with that, except that if that's all she's allowed to do, she doesn't have control over her finances. She doesn't have control over her life. She doesn't have an ability to um to study or to to better herself in any way she is she is limited and when that becomes catastrophic is when it all blows up um, I've actually worked with a particular situation where the male clergyman ultimately was defrocked and left a wife and five children destitute because mm. she had no income he had no income to go to provide to her after he lost his job because he was only trained to be one thing and it's only for the um, the goodwill and care of um, people who helped her to find a home and to make sure her children were able to be cared for and educated and helped her to get back on her feet. I've now seen that woman flourish, um, go back to university, find her place in this world. But where the real damage then lies in what's happening to God's kingdom. Yeah. That family don't go to church anymore. Um, they they were humiliated by what happened to them. It's so public when your clergy marriage blows up. Um, and, you know, we are losing souls for the kingdom mm. purely because we are denying the reality that we are distorting the gospel. We aren't attacking the unjust structures. We aren't doing what Jesus called us to do. We're actually, we are sinning at a, a level that... It, it's unmeasurable. And the number of intelligent, capable young men and women, my own children, for example, they've, what, they're really proud of me that I've made this change. But do you think they will go to a church in Sydney? Not a chance. And, you know, we are not doing God's work if we continue to do what we're doing with headship as a doctrine. And just as an aside, it's also starting to permeate into the doctrine of the Trinity. We're actually teaching false doctrine about the community of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And we are not enabling people, men and women, to understand fully that divine dance of love that is the community of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's it, yeah. <laughs> well. Yeah, this is all so intense and real and for people, this is people's stories, right? This is impacting um, women and men and the good work and referring back to what Melissa Lipset said that I read at the beginning. Now, this is kind of a good segue then into um, Jackie. Jackie, you're a lecturer in systematic um, theology at um, Charles Sturt University and your research focus is on Trinitarian theology, divine ontology of well-being, and theology of development and social justice and we hadn't planned to move into this, but this is kind of perfect for um, right, part of this conversation. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I find this mind-boggling, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. And when I first heard this, I was like, what? Um, so that, so this is, yeah, it is one of the most mind-boggling arguments when it comes to supposed gender hierarchy is that the marriage relationship is modelled on a hierarchical ordering of relationships in the Trinity. Can you please explain how they get there? What's wrong with that? Just that whole picture just 
that would be you know in about five minutes would be great yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> right. two thousand years of trinitarian theology five minutes. Okay. um essentially where it comes from is this kind of when you read the scriptures there seems to be in the economic acts of God. So when I say economic acts of God, I mean in God's expression and demonstration in the world, what he does in the world, especially through Jesus Christ, there seems to be some kind of uh, subordination or submission of Jesus to the Father, right? So he says things like the Father is greater than I, um, he, you know, not, your, not my will but your will, things like this. So people have taken that and they're, they're trying to wrestle, well, what is this? Is there some kind of hierarchy between the son and the father? Um, and so taking from, from that, there's two key kind of views have been propounded, I, I guess, in traditionally. One is what um, Erickson, Millard Erickson's written a book on tampering with the Trinity, and he calls it the equivalent authority view. So he says, uh, uh, yep, there's the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They're, they're eternally equal. Um, they're fully divine. They have equal authority. But in the incarnation of the Son, uh, there is a taking on of humanity. There's a temporality here of Jesus. And so because of the incarnation and salvation history, we see elements of what we call obedience or submission of the son to the father. So that's one view. The other view is what's called the gradational equivalent uh, authority view, which is they say, no, this is not just a temporal salvation history thing. This is ontological. This is goes back into the eternal nature of who the Trinity is. There is an eternal functional subordination of the son to the Father. And they don't speak so much of the Holy Spirit, but the same th elements are there for the Spirit. The Spirit and the Son are passive to the active kind of will of the Father. Uh, so they kind of say basically that they're equal in being, subordinate in role. So now you can start to see your connections, right, where you get uh, from that kind of idea of the Trinity that there is this eternal subordination of, of function uh, in the Trinity, then analogies are then made. Well, we're made in the image of God, right? Especially women and women are uh, made in the image of God in marriage. And so analogies are then made from that. We go, oh, that's how God is. That's how relations between men and women must be. So they appeal to uh, what I think is a distorted, mm -hmm. uh, and, and many others uh, say it's a distorted view of the Trinity. It's actually you uh we could say be nice and say they're in error you could say that they are repeating an arian heresy from nicaea where you have uh, so arius you know basically said that the son is not really the same as the father they're not the same essence they're similar but not the same right so you get this subordination and uh, athanasius and others at nicaea they all had a big Barney over it and Athanasius won and said, no, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit um, uh, are homoousios. They are the same essence. So the Father and the Son are the same essence. They have the complete, the Son has the same equivalence of authority, um, of um, being as the Father. Because you, if you don't posit that, you have a, you don't have Jesus full, as fully God and then it has impacts on your soteriology and your salvation and a whole lot of things. So um, so basically that's how it, it occurs is, is this deformed kind of uh, theology. The problem is that when you start to say, well, eternally the son is submissive, um, so uh, the son has a will that is submissive to the father's will, uh, you're kind of positing two wills in God and Orthodox Trinitarian theology will say, no, there's only one will in God because God is one. We have three persons, one God, one in three and the three in one. And obviously we don't have time to get into all of that, but essentially it's saying that there is no, the father does not have his divinity, cannot be God without the son. So wait a minute. 
isn't the father now reliant on the son to be the father and vice versa, right? So there's these other kind of views that I think we need to, to look at here where actually if you look at, and this is what Angela kind of mentioned, that the early church, particularly the Cappadocian fathers, um, fourth century, they spoke of this kind of uh, um, coherence, this kind of mutual reciprocity between the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, completely equal. And they constantly, if you look at scripture, um, they're constantly blessing one another. They're glorifying one another. No divine person ever gives them self-praise. It's always Jesus to the Father. The Father, um, you know, affirms the Son at the baptism and says, this is my Son. I love him. You know, you get these kind of relational, if you really look at it, there's mutual, uh, mutuality, reciprocity, there's love, there's glory, there's blessing. They talk to each other. They sing to one another. Um you don't get, uh, you, you so that I think is the mirror, this divine dance, as Angela said, that what we see actually is co-equality uh, and that is orthodox Christianity and anything that says that they're not co-equal or if their function is somehow different uh, from their essence, well, that doesn't occur in God. God's function what God does is the same as who he is. Because if it's not, we don't have a self-revelation of God, right? We're still guessing who he is if he's not demonstrating in the world exactly who he is. And so when you understand that the, actually in the Trinity there's this other-centred constant giving to the other, mm. then the works of God in the world start to make sense. What does God do in the incarnation? What are we told in Philippians? What did Jesus do? He did exactly what he's always been doing. Emptied himself for the others so that life might come. Right? So the incarnation makes sense. The cross makes sense. This is a demonstration of the eternal nature of who God is. God is the self-giving God. And in his act of self-giving on the cross, that's where life comes for us. And so this is constant through God's being. Uh, the way he acts is completely uh, commensurate with who he is in the internal uh, triune relations. And so we have to understand what who we think God is is yeah. going to have a big connection to how we think God acts in the world and who we're imaging yeah. so if we don't know who our god is if we don't understand his nature is this i mean honestly he's beyond words bizarre you have a god who is willing to go to a cross yeah. for his creatures like that's phenomenal i just think if you let that sit with you you just think who are you and that, if we get that, and that's an act of the spirit, let's be clear about this. This is not an act of reason. You're not going to reason yourself there. You can put all the arguments to people, but the spirit of God has to come and reveal this is who he is and this is what he's on about uh, to give us life. And when you understand who he is, then he asks us as an act of worship, we look at who he is, we recognise who he is, what he does, and then we reorientate our lives to be like him. That's worship, to be like that who we gaze on. That's worship. And if we're not doing that, we're not worshipping him. I have a question. I have a question. So good. Jackie, <laughs> yes. so if, so with. Amen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah so the father and son in the trinity uh honoring and always you know loving each other perfectly yeah that kind of model is taken and put in marriage it just mm. strikes me as so odd that we take the submission bit but we don't take the perfection bit like i think a lot of women would happily 
submit to a perfect husband, like someone who loved them and served them and had their best interest at heart and actually did everything good for them. But yeah. Yeah. nobody exists that would ever do that. Yes. So, That's a really, really good point. There is, and we need to have a caveat on all this, there is a massive ontological distinction between the creator and the creature. So we can't just go, oh, that's how God is, that's how we should be, because we're talking about completely different yeah. types of being. So do you think like the submission said, argument holds when you transfer it like that? I think it's mutual. Um, look, hypotasso, uh, hypotasso, however you want to pronounce it, um, the word for submission uh, or subordination in the New Testament, um, I think... We need to understand there is this idea, and others have spoken about it, uh, Jen, I've been watching them, and they've been great sessions, about this mutuality. So let's understand submission. We, I like to think of it almost as giving way, right? A, a, a tree gives way um, to the wind, right? It gives way. It submits to the wind. We're in acts of submission, I hate the word, but let's just go with it. Yielding, doesn't, it doesn't matter how you say it, but we're, we're constantly giving way to things all the time. When I went to the shops this afternoon, I gave way and submitted to the red light, okay? Well, this is our life. We're constantly doing it. Um, so I think there still is that mutual element between not just men and women, but in all relationships. We all have to kind of, give way to each other. That's the, that's the dynamics of relationality. Um, the questions are about how you do that in a healthy manner. Um, you know, my idea is that, well, kenosis, self-giving, it, it's a, in God, it's an enriching kenosis. It's not just being a doormat, right? That's why feminists hate the idea of kenotic theology. And I think it's because they have a truncated theology. They've just got the self-giving bit. No, self-giving in God always has life attached to it and enrichment attached to it. So there has to be some kind of giving and receiving between humans, which is to bring life. That's the whole purpose of it, flourishing and enrichment to the other. Uh, it's all become distorted, though, through sin where we want egoistical enrichment. I want to be enriched without the giving to the other. And that's what you probably see in, this is a theological construction, but within distorted and asymmetrical relationships, particularly in marriage. I think that's exactly what I see um, when the theology of headship is, is held, as you've just described, and then directly transferred to relationships and it just goes so wrong and sin is so present and it's not life-giving. So we've taken part of it but not the whole. Yeah. And the, the results are damaging, harmful, hurtful. Yeah, we need a good theology of sin. Mm. We need to know who we are. So we can have, you need two things. You have to have a good theology of the fallenness of humanity. Let's be real here. But let's also be real about the magnificence of the redemption brought through Jesus Christ, right? We've got these two things. But if we only operate in one sphere, then, you know, we'll either have a utopian kind of concept if we don't understand the nature of sin. And I hear a lot of women talking about this, that they're kind of, um, they get angry about it and they're surprised at it. Where well, I'm like, you're surprised at injustice? Really? Like, you're surprised that this is occurring? I'm not. Because why? Because I think people are... Beep. Anyway. <laughs> people are sinful. That's why it took God to come. This is not... Re we can't reason our way out of this one. That's why Jesus had to come. So let's have a whole a good idea that people are really sinful uh, and that let that has to be in there in this this theology we have, but also um, we need to have that kind of idea that there is hope through Christ for the redemption of that which is broken. You know, we need both. Otherwise, we'll just get to despair. That's why I stay in the Sydney Anglican Church. 
you, I mean, I've got a million stories where I've just cried in my walk-in robe uh, with my kids coming in going, it's okay, mum, God will use you. Um, and because I won't, I'm not allowed to preach, you know, and it, it's a, it hurts. I can't, I have cried to a previous minister saying, I just want to serve my Lord and you won't let me. You know, I've had that pain, but I'm not walking away from the Anglican church because I believe in, uh, I believe what scripture says about men and women and that we're to flourish and we are to be, like Angela said before, we are to be like, he wants to blow the lid off the church so we, we they see the glory of God. And I'm not letting the Anglican church um, get away with it. <laughs> so, so I'm staying. And I'm, but I do it in love. I've done it out of anger before, and that is not what God wanted for me. So now I stay in love because I think my brothers are in error and I love them enough to say, this is a diminution of you while you diminish me. Thanks, Jackie. And in the famous words of uh, Hunt for the Wilder people, shit just got real, but I wish more of my colleagues actually mm. could hear that pain. Yeah. and force themselves to try and reconcile how that can be what God wants, yeah. how that is part of God's sovereign good design. Mm. Uh, and I think that the weight of that pain and those tears, that's pretty compelling that we've not got things right. No. You know, you don't need, you need to move into the atrocities of DV and abuse of power, but simply that people with gifts, and we've seen it on display, with intellect we've seen it on display, uh, have to go and cry after church because they're not able, how that can be part of what God wants. That's, that's where the rubber hits the road for my colleagues, and I'm not sure they've got a satisfactory answer to that. I'll talk around it, but to actually address that head on, I think that's a difficulty for for the system. But, you know, like the Lord has shaped me through it too because he has made it clear to me that he doesn't want this to be an idol. He's my Lord, not the feminist agenda. It's because he's my Lord, that's why I will do what I do and speak about women, not because... I don't want that. It's not the other way around. <laughs> so, so there is yeah. stuff he's had. I wasn't to... talking about that. I was talking about actually reconciling. Yeah. What I believe God is doing with what your experience, and it's obviously not just your story. It's repeated um, thousands of times. Um, oh, I'm sure Angela, you know, you, well, you well, said you've experienced it. And been mates with Julia 20 years. Like when I met you, you were still bruised and wounded and getting hate mail from SNID debates from mm. you know, the 1990s. Yeah, I was on Synod for 10 years. Um, mm. I got a lot of hate mail. But, you know, mm. I, mean, I think I would be cautious. Like, the, like having studied it, this is how I got involved in this. I studied, I wrote my honours thesis about the movement for the ordination of women. That, if we use the word agenda, and, and I, 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 I'm careful of that word because it's usually that men have convictions and women have agendas, and I, 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 that concerns me. Um, that group of women... The ragtag group of women and men that rose up to say what people have been saying for centuries. Uh, Jackie, what you said just then, that lament, mm. exact, almost exactly those words were said by Florence Nightingale mm. more than 200 years ago. She oh, said, yeah. I would have given the church my head, my heart, my everything, and they gave me no work to do. Okay. Yeah. She's brilliant. Mm. What she went on to do. And... Um, the, the, you know, the group that rose up here in the 70s and the 80s and so on, um, actually a lot of them came, they talked about domestic violence very early on in those groups, um, but was simply to have women speak, was simply to have women witness. Mm -hmm. And I don't really see it as, a, as, as an agenda in any sense, because like, I think we're constantly told that women will do something that is destructive and all we're trying to do is... is, is that women have been trying to do for a long time is to clear the ways that they can speak 
and that their gifts can be used. And Jeff, to your point, you say, I wish my colleagues could have heard that. Those stories have been told again and again and again and again. I've written them, I've spoken them, I've heard them. Um, and we now have a whole other issue around a kind of a cultural identity, which is, you know, to do with, with, with this idea of headship. Um, and that, that, that is the problem. I'm not saying we don't continue to, to tell them that we don't, because it's it, you know it's, it's it's lived and it's it, it remains a problem and I think part of the problem is it's often cast as something coming from outside of wanting to destroy the whole thing right mm. which would be the, you know a problem if the whole thing is predicated on that positioning of women like should that be the foundation of the church that that's where women are um, and and part of my problem with reporting is um, I am talking to we all speak a certain language, um, Christians, and then there's the there's an Anglican language, and then there's a Sydney Anglican language. Mm. And try translating that. Yeah, like I, like I am not allowed to use the word complementarianism. I'm just not allowed. I've tried. The, my editors just go, I can't. It means nothing to me. It means mm. so patriarchy. You can't use that word. Like it, like the, the like it just doesn't. And I've I've, I've done um, you know, whole pieces where I've mentioned headship, and that I. The number of people who come up to me in the newsroom and go, sorry, what? What is that again? And and mm. I have to do verbal gymnastics to try to explain mm. it, you know, like mm. from the position of someone who holds that view. Um, and I think that's that's very that's very problematic. It's the same thing with the whole idea of the equal but different. Mm. So um, if I was to try to again speak about that in the newsroom to a bunch to a different to secular, secular audience it's it's impossible it would be like saying we've got black people we've got white people love them value them they're the same everyone's the same in god's eyes the black people can only sweep and you know clean up and the white people will you know um rule the world and and make all the decisions and do all that kind of thing and then you say well see that's obviously equality right i mean it's just it's um so, so trying to straddle that is a bit like um, <laughs> who's that guy, that um, actor who straddles those two trucks and then they then they eventually split when he's playing chicken. I'm going to think of it in a moment. Not the rock. Um, anyway, it is it, it is straddling two worlds and and um, no one's ever really entirely happy because um, there's a, there's a broader community that just absolutely does not understand it and then there's a there's a church community that wants you to always be couching things in very kind of positive terms and using a different kind of language that just doesn't that doesn't actually compute so anyway mm. um, and but then that's when the, all the world sees is a church turning inward on itself constantly ill at ease with who it is performing abuse on its own people you know it's not just domestic violence abuse that I think comes from this doctrine of headship you look at all of the other abuses that have happened within the church and our our inability to see beyond what's really happening in our churches and what's happening to people and happening because clergy themselves have behaved inappropriately yeah. and all the world sees is a bunch of hypocritical humans who say one thing and are doing another. We know that's not the church. We know the church is much better than that and capable of more. But we're not doing the church a service because we can't speak their language and they don't speak our language. Mm. But there is also when we say the church, I think most of us are Anglican here. <clears throat> is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The mix. It, it is quite a specific thing we're talking about Sydney Anglican Diocese mm. is quite on its own a little bit with some of this. It's extreme. It's an extreme. Yeah. Because my my friend, um, uh, she's in the Uniting Church in, in Melbourne, uh, a pastor there, and she's like, why are you guys all still talking about that? We, like, dealt with this mm -hmm. years ago. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. In, in a lot of churches, and I've taught in uh, Alpha Crucis College, Pentecostal co uh, theological college, and it's not uh, it's not a doctrine there either. There, you know, lots of women pastors, amazing. Um, so yeah, it's. I just wanted to just for those who are out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, 
that it's not the whole, we can't just, you know, paint the whole church We're with this brush. Very cool. Yeah. But I also think you don't have to have a doctrine of headship by the diocese to still have patriarchy. And there's certainly st- most of the church is still quite patriarchal. Yeah. Uh, whatever. Rather it's knows best. Yep. So we've got CBE yeah. in Perth. We've got CBE in Mel, and for a reason. Like they don't just. Well, we've got organisations like the um, biblical equality movements around the world because it's not just it's just not Sydney that has this problem, is it? Like that's right. Um, and Julia, you've been spearheading this discussion between the connection between male headship and domestic violence, and been working for such a long time to shine a light mm-hmm. into dark places within the Australian church, not just Sydney Anglicanism, although that's the one that has been most recently um, talked about. But um, and almost 10 years ago, um, in 2012, um, you wrote that piece, No Place for a Spirited Woman. And I remember the moment that I saw that in the paper and it changed my life because I was like, there's someone else out there like me. Um, and in that you wrote, so the Sydney Anglicans are very fond of the doctrine of headship the belief that men are the natural heads of women. They have gained a well-deserved reputation for preaching it often, loudly, and in increasingly inventive ways. Instead of obsessing on, say, poverty or climate change, clerical men in Sydney often appear most intent on controlling women. And it was around the time that the word submit um, was well and truly um, ingrained into part of the marriage vows. Um, And your voice in this space has been so important. I just want to honour and thank you for your the work that you've done there because you have gone ahead and that I, I can't even I can't even fathom um, just and I've seen a little bit of the flack that you have received and so thank you for your work there now mm-hmm. as part of this what and you've spoken and you've spent time and I can't tell you how many women have told me just how and they've they've wanted to say thank you to you or honor you in the way that you've listened to them and you've been their voice, so you've provided a platform for that voice to be shared, whether that's in print or whether that is under the um, shroud of um, being anonymous um, on our screens. But what are some of the common themes that you've observed from these testimonies of women who have spoken out, um, such brave women who have shared? And I guess, you know, why would they? Why do they? Why are they doing this? Um, why are they? Why are they coming to you? Why are they sharing it? Because they don't want it to happen to other people. Mm. Um, I think fundamentally, um, they just want it to stop. Um, and because you know some of the impacts of this theology taught wrong, taught harmfully, um, lands on you know women's bodies. And and I really was noticing. I mean, you were talking about a um, clergy um, wife, uh, Angela, when, when you, who you've helped and who's now flourishing and. Um, I stay in contact with a lot of the women that I've reported on, and and I, I when this most recent report came in, came out, the Anglicans commissioned a report, you know, um, that um, found that the, the, the pre- you know that there was a higher prevalence amongst that group than in the broader population. I noticed this whole brawl um, start up about statistics and. Um, it was a doctrine or was it the twisting of the doctrine and it, the whole debate was happening over here in the meantime I was still talking to these women mm. and I called one from this support group there was a support group at Moore College of clergy wives who'd been abused and most of them are homeless right now mm. um, with homelessness comes depression with homelessness comes uncertainty with homelessness comes children who, whose, whose futures are, are very impacted. So the fact that these women who really gave their lives to their partners, to the church, and then find themselves split and with kind of basically nothing. Um, it's great that, that Sydney, was it Mark, what's his name? Greg, Mark Tur, oh, Greg, sorry, Jeff, Mark Tur, Mark, the guy that put the um, motion to get support for clergy wives and synod. Anyway, he's from Sydney, <laughs> West. You'll think of it. Um, or I will. Um, that's really great. But but the disconnect was so severe to me. I have not ever had a woman who's been through that experience or a man, because we've told the stories of some blokes as well, but it's just primarily about them. Ever say to me, she's let's sit down and go through these statistics. It's never. They wanted to be heard. 
they want it to be to be recognised that this occurs, the form that it takes within the church. And that's always been my assumption. I've never been particularly concerned with prevalence because um, as a reporter and on my show, we do domestic violence all the time, everywhere, all over the place. It's always been worse than we know. And I think the real problem is the, been the assumption in the church that there's a protective factor um, and it, that, it, that it will be better there. And it won't, and that... It, because it should be, it should be a place of refuge and it should be a place of healing and that's where you should go to be. But the fact that it could be the opposite, um, yeah. I think the denial has struck me very, very intently for like the whole way along um, and a distraction. Let's talk about a study in New Zealand in the 1980s as Andrew Bolt kept doing or something in the, in the 1990s as a Virginia professor did which was a study which asked a group of people, have you physically injured your partner in the last year? Like that was the distraction which came up three years ago. And meanwhile, these women were all watching, you know, they were all um, online looking at Twitter, mm. looking at like Facebook and watching the leaders of their church deny and squabble yeah. and carry on about the yeah. stuff that did not matter. They and attack you, who was the messenger for them, right? That's, all part, that's always part of it. Yeah, um, they're wrong for them yeah, to see so, that. So, um, but but I, I kind of grieved for them in that sense because it's just at what point? Oh, no, we need to have another study. Oh, now we really need a prevalence thing. Oh, well, the prevalence thing showed it was a problem. Oh, well, that's not. We, <laughs> that that can't be right. We'll do something else. It, just, it doesn't matter. We, we, we just have to listen to the women in in our midst. And they are women who've wanted to serve faithfully and who um, have said that, you know, the doctrines about actually remarriage, not just about separation, but about remarriage, which a lot of diocese have not been clear on, have been problematic. Also about forgiveness. Um, and also about, um, obviously, about, about submission. And... I mean, when, you know, the first time I, I, I met you, Kylie, I, I mean, I, I talked to a whole bunch of counsellors who said to me, this comes up again and again and again. And it was their testimony I was trying to put forward. Um, Is there research about churches that don't hold a headship, whatever doctrine? Yeah. And, and, and they preach the opposite, in fact, but this still is prevalent? Um, because... Uh, I think we yeah. assume it's everywhere. Yeah. I, th I think we can understand that there's certain cultures in which it can 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 flourish um, mm. or even not be noticed. Mm. Would you notice coercive control if you know um, if a lot of if if you thought that I mean people really struggle to to explain what the practical application of headship is. If I say here's a part, show me an egalitarian couple to use this language and show mm -hmm. me a complementarian couple, how do they look? How do they look different? And they're, they're all committed to each other. They're all committed to Christ. They all want to flourish. Like, what's the, where is it, right? Um, so, but if you think that it's a, it's a, it's the, the man taking charge or making the decisions, um, then that's kind of problematic for a lot of people who, um, you know, are into co coercive control. Mm, I think that's something a lot of people didn't understand. They kept thinking domestic violence was only physical. Mm. And only extreme. Um, no. I do think there's a strong sexual component in a lot of faith communities. I do think there's, um, that was something that took me back, actually. Um, the number of kind of rapes um, and sexual assaults that occurred um, uh, because people felt that it was, oh, I'm so sorry, my daughter is actually knocking on the door and my son's asleep. Sorry. On that note, on that light note of rapes and sexual assault, I'll be right. So let me perhaps jump in. Sure, you were going to hide the fact that you were in bed. <laughs> I love it. Oh, so funny. You don't look like you're on a lounge anymore, love. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back. What's the to question you. for us? So what was the question for me as an Anglican minister in Sydney when Julie's reporting started to come? Uh, the th three basic options according to the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor. In the face of wrongdoing, you can decide my enemies to blame, and that's what leads to violence and wars. You know, uh, that's the bad apple theory, right? Okay, here are the bad apples. We'll get rid of the bad apples. We're okay. 
Uh, he said there's another option, particularly prominent, and this is no, uh, not having a go at you, Kylie, but it's kind of post-Freud that, well, no one's really to blame. We know most perpetrators themselves were abused, so kind of like, you know, it's so we don't say anyone's to blame. He said, no, the, the question that we need to ask in the face of wrongdoing, and he, he goes to the South, uh, South Africa experience and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's a powerful question. He, he says it's actually Tutu that asked it. Never been able to find the quote from Tutu. How did this happen in our midst? Mm. Mm-hmm. That's the question. Now, to give them credit, the diocese actually tried to do that. And hats off here to Sandy Grant and Cara Hartley and others who worked on this. But you know what? In their investigation, they're asking that question. The terms of reference, they weren't allowed to look at headship. Oh, wow. So how did this happen in our midst? But we won't look at the issue you're raising for us, Jen. So we got a lot of the way there in trying to understand, but this was off, off limits. Um, so, you know, back to the parallel of Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, how did this happen in our midst? Uh, now, I'm not uh, wanting to compare headship and apartheid, but you can imagine, say, but not, let's not look at apartheid. Like, it just wouldn't have worked. You can't ask how did this happen in our midst and not have a really honest, hard look. And, yes, some of the... Some of the violence, intra-tribal violence, was on view in the Truth and Record. It wasn't just white and black. It was actually, and so I think what I would love more of is that really honest searching. How did this happen in our midst? I think we owe it to the testimonies that have come forward, that have spoken to Julie and other reporters. I think we owe it to the thousands of stories like Jackie, people, and Angela as well, mm-hmm. who sit with that pain you know for years yeah how, how people we are like, saying that on the comments they're thanking them um both for sharing their stories because they it's their story as well they they can hear the pain they recognize the pain yep they're so they, they were so brave those women who even to tell it anonymously i can say has a huge impact Sometimes it can be freeing. Other times it can be exasperating, exhausting, and you know all of that stuff. But then to still be grappling with homelessness and everything at the same time, it's, you know, I don't know. I feel you know, um, I feel constantly concerned uh, w- whether whether we've done enough to care for those people. Um, and where we should be concerned, Julia, is that, you know, whilst you've gone to such great lengths to help these ladies to tell their story, we don't get resolution, we don't get change, we don't get acknowledgement of how this has happened. And then the stories are being told over and again. And um, at least two of the people who are survivors of these circumstances that I've spoken to recently, as this has all come back up again, after the domestic violence in um, the Anglican Church report came out, is their trigger tra- their trauma triggering trauma over and over again. Women who all of a sudden feel anxiety again, who are experiencing that whole feeling of "Am I good enough?" and starting to feel that level of depression, all the reminders of being denied access to their children, or you know, I could go on and on. Um, it doesn't heal their wounds. It actually makes their wounds to go deeper because nobody, well, they they feel the people who should be listening are not listening. Yeah, that's the one thing that Grace Tame has also made a real point of. She has said, do not ask us to tell our trauma again and again. Yep. Um, I think Stan Grant says the same thing about Indigenous people. Do, do we have to keep cutting open our veins to, to tell you what it's been like? Um, and I do feel that, Angela. I do feel that those stories have been told. That it, there's just an absolute mountain of of research. But I also have seen, you know, a, a, a lot of people genuinely grapple with it, and then suddenly understand it's in their publication. Yeah. I mean, my local minister, my local Anglican minister, suddenly, within a matter of weeks, was aware of four to five cases and hadn't thought about it. You know, that's um, really good to hear. Yeah, and then and, I- and and I work in a diocese where our bishop um, leads the charge on this, and uh, you know we're all attending training around how to make our churches safe and how to to pastor and care for people who've been through these experiences, how to recognise it. Um, you know we're on high alert as to how to be better, yeah. um, but I'm I work in a diocese where it's a priority. Yeah, 
which is awesome. I mean, that's a that's a, that's a, that's a huge and fundamental shift, right? Um, but I, you know, I, I mean, Jackie, Jeff, everyone. I mean, I do I do think there's something particular to to where we are and the hostility that even talking about this can sometimes engender in terms of the denial. And I tell you what, like, what concerns me, because this comes into my inbox all the time, right? But I was really happy when um, last year someone called me from a very conservative parish and said, look, I've really, I've started to really think about it. And now I realise, yeah, there's all these cases in my, in the parish and so on. And we had a long chat about what he was doing about domestic violence and that was great. But then this week, someone emailed me who's had a really terrible experience with domestic violence and has had to leave her partner. He, he, con he was constantly threatening to kill her. And, um, and she had told me that she came home from a, um, a, a big kind of booming parish and where there'd been a, a sermon on headship and her then husband had brought the sermon home, scrunched it up, and thrown it at her feet and said, you don't listen to it. You should be, you should be submitting to me. You should be, um, you, you, know, you should be doing what I say, blah, blah, blah. And then he raped her. And then apparently he used to often do that on Sunday, she said, but he's, she's left him. She's very close to someone who's a very prominent um, person who's been speaking against a, 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 lot, of, a lot of the reporting. And the weird thing is, I discovered just this week, the guy who called me to thank me, it was his sermon, right? I know, and I don't even have the heart to tell him that. Um, and then I, I hope, and then I think, well, maybe that's a sign of, maybe that's a sign of, of, of some kind of change and some kind of thought around it. But then she says, no, she's gone to another church. Her ex has followed her there, which is very common. And he, um, and the minister says, you've got to forgive him and you should not worry about him being here at the church. That's just the way it is. You know, he has a relationship with God too. And, he has to, and that minister has been through all of the training. So it's those kinds of things as well. Like there's, there's, it, it, I'm so yeah, but this is the thing. It's not just about not having a doctrine of headship. Oh, no, it's of all the cultural it, issues. It, no, oh. but it, it, it's also about because the church needs to be teaching what it means to be a person. Yeah. Right? So what yeah. we have is a deficient, we've got one theology being taught, and yet most people don't have any idea what does it really mean to be a flourishing human being? What does that even mean? What does it look like? You Like you kind of mentioned. And that's the thing is that you ne we need to be upping our game in teaching people about, well, actually there's certain things about what makes a, a human uh, functional in terms of how God created humans to be. Like humans are I meant to, like Rowan Williams says, I love this, that humans were meant to name the animals. We're meant to be able to have the agency to name animals, to make meaning and the means by which to make the meaning and all these type of wonderful things about what it means to be human and have personhood. And I don't hear, you don't really hear anything about the opposite either, which so needs to be, you know. We don't talk enough about the Beatitudes. We don't talk enough about the Holy Spirit and what it looks like to be someone living and walking in step and in tune with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, it's this is not just looking at the headship of um, doctrine. This is like a whole bigger picture okay. going on here. Who are and we washing the gifts? Yeah. yeah, who is God? Who is yeah. God? Yeah. Mm, who is yeah. Jesus? Like, the you know, I got um, <clears throat> when my, um, my ex-husband had multiple affairs, and when I, I had to leave that particular location so I could get family help because he left the family and left me with three children. And um, I had people from the church um, telling me that people were talking about it, that that, that happened because um, I was not submitting. <laughs> I was not a submissive wife. And I was studying my PhD in theology, you know, wasn't like these kind of ideas that somehow his sin 
was my fault. Um, it was like just and that's, that's, like that's unbelievable- the essence. That's the essence of an abusive dynamic right. where your your behave my behavior is your responsibility. Yeah, that's kind of the definition of an abuser. So you've described it then in a, in a perpetrator, but in a church too, mm-hmm. where there's there, that ideology exists that mm-hmm. his sin is your responsibility. And you might know that rights and responsibilities paddock in the, the, the DV literature where it should be 50-50. I have these rights. I have these responsibilities in a relationship. But the perpetrator just shifts that and has all the rights and hardly any of the responsibilities. And the victim has all the responsibilities and hardly any of the rights. That's yeah. exactly what you've described. So the ideologies yeah. can mirror from the church that mm-hmm. is being harmful to the husband that's being harmful. Mm. It's like it's the title of Jess Hill's book about domestic violence, right? See what you that's, made me do. That's it. It's your fault that I did this yeah. to you. Yeah. And perpetrators, they, I mean, I, I've heard that said a bunch of times. She used that because that's what perpetrators use. Right. Um, their, their understanding of humanity, as you've been describing, and their understanding of mutuality is so warped. They'll say things like, yeah, I hit her, but she deserved it. Yeah, I yelled at her, but I had to. Yeah, I knocked some sense into her, but, but she needs to learn. Yes, I raped her, but we're married. Like they admit to, to the acts that they've done, but the moral understanding of it is very different. Mm. So I think your, your kind of questions about what is personhood, what is mutuality, Mm. That's really central to this because um, a perpetrator and a victim and, a, and a, a psychologist or a police officer will all agree on what happened. It's just mm. that their view of whether it's okay or not is the bit that differs. Mm. So I think that's kind of what we're talking about in the church as well. We're all agreeing what's happening, that women can't preach, women can't do this, that and the other. It's our perspective on, sure, but is that okay? But we're also saying it's okay to go back to your husband because that's what Jesus called you to do to maintain your marriage and to protect, you know, to not to divorce and to do it. So that's just informing and enabling the perpetrator and further diminishing the, the person who's being a victim of this violence. Yeah, thinking that divorce or death is the only thing that ends a marriage rather than... And most, most people get to that point. Well, I think abuse ends a marriage. As soon as you're abusing a spouse, that's not marriage. What a, no. what a dreadfully low view of marriage to think that it's still a marriage if someone is treating the other person badly. That's not marriage. No. I think the no, marriage the is at that point. The covenant is broken. That's yeah. right. The covenant is already broken. Yeah. And also I think the church has also made marriage an idol. Mm. Like it's almost like... You're, you know, it's part of one of the sacraments that we're meant to do. Well, it is in some churches, but um, <laughs> in the Anglicans, no. <laughs> but, but well, there it is. It's elevated like somehow you're not really a full human unless you're in a a marriage or a, some kind of relationship. And we don't have space for friendship. We don't talk about friendship. We don't talk about singleness. We, we just have this marriage kind of thing and it must be saved at all costs. So, like, well, your marriage is not going to give you salvation. Like, when marriage is elevated over the safety of the people in the family. Yeah. Marriage by the time you're 25, right? Now I've got some questions coming through and there's some fairly similar themes here. Um, it says, I work in a complementarian context. They would say they care about and want to actively respond to DFE. They do not see the link between their theology and DFE. How do we convince them? I encourage them to ring, read um, Kevin Giles' book. It's called The Headship of Men and the Abuse of Women. It was only published in 2000. And he actually does an incredible exegesis of all of these um, proof texts and talks about what they are, what they mean, how they are interpreted. He actually provides the um a really strong case for how headship um, informs domestic violence between men and women. You've got to, you've got to, I, I believe it's really important to tackle this issue where it starts and it starts with pulling a whole bunch of proof texts up and saying this is why we believe this. It's, it's taking those texts and then providing really good translation and exegesis that then enables the, uh, the complementarian to understand a little bit more about what, what it's saying to them. 
because they take it as read from somebody who supposedly understands. They don't necessarily, you know, not everybody who stands in a pulpit has, um, you know, really great Greek or um, really good exegesis skills. A lot of it is what we are taught and then yes. it's dependent yes. on... Regurgitated sometimes. Mm. Mm. Um, I've written a bit about that. So if you search complementarianism and domestic violence on fixing her eyes, I've got an article about that. And I've um, expanded that article um, in a chapter that's coming out in Discovering Biblical Equality that Jen mentioned at the beginning. That's due for release in October. So I've got a chapter in there on the relationship between male headship and DV. There's so many more women just agreeing with everything that you're saying and sharing their stories of um, I've had a past, pastor ask me to repent of expecting too much from my husband to not abuse me. Most of the time, the church is not the place to go for help or understanding. Um, what can we be doing? What, 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 what needs, what can we do? And I know, I know for, uh, Jeff, I, we've put you in a really tricky spot and I'm so sorry because this is really feels very unfair that you're just like representing every man that's ever stood in a pulpit for you know, all time. But <laughs> If, if you could say one thing to your colleagues who you say headship isn't causing damage, it is the only the twisting of it, which we've heard them say, and oh, that is... I, I have more than one thing. So I, I, think, go for I think kind of teaching we've been talking about, it's obviously important, especially when things haven't been taught well. But I think, oh, look, I'm a practical theologian. One of the things I'm crying out for is people actually living faithfully yeah. and muddling along. So... I guess, you know, I'd be described as an egalitarian. I, I never use that language myself, but uh, that's how I see my relationship with Jackie. Ten years ago, she gave up a perfectly good job in Sydney so that I could teach theology in Canberra. Now, that technically should get us kicked out of the egalitarian club. At exactly the same time, I've got a very good friend who was obviously a prestigious job in another city who's a complementarian, and he didn't take it because his wife didn't want to move. Now, that theoretically should get him kicked out of the the complementarian club. I think ideology actually gets in the way often of us just muddling along, trying to live faithfully to our partners and to our God. So I think the labelling, there's a lot of fear in the labelling. And so that's why I don't talk much about these things because I think it actually gets in the way of making progress sometimes. What does it look like to live faithfully to your partner? Uh, and I'm glad in my early years, Chris and Jan Forbes, Chris is on, Chris and Jan, just one of many, Robert and Julie Banks, others who actually model this stuff, how it works. And I think that's true in the egalitarian world. I don't think there's particularly great models of that either. Um, as I think, you know, well, the models are taken up now. So the previous Archbishop of Sydney, you know, formerly complementarian headship, he said twice in 38 years did he have to actually make a call. That's pretty marginal, isn't it? Two decisions in 38 years, like what does that actually mean? So, again, the ideology actually means nothing in terms of how they lived. I think for, apart, if you didn't see those two occasions, 38 years, you'd look at that relationship, say, looks pretty egalitarian to me. So um, the damage is sometimes done by people holding to these positions that are actually unlivable on both sides. And certainly we need to be talking about the unlivability, I think, for many people. So I don't think it's just a problem when it goes bad. I actually think a lot of the good guys don't know how to live it well, which goes back to my very early point. What is God's good design for this? Like what, what, how does this contribute to human flourishing? Mm -hmm. uh, and I agree with Angel, we need to look do the exegesis, but actually that, that's not going to change hearts and minds. But I think the sort of questions we're talking about, what does it mean to be faithful to God? What does human uh, living world look like under God? And if we can start to, and I think the scriptures actually have a lot to say about that. Um, if we can be talking about that, then maybe that gives people room to move. But if people feel like there's two camps and you have got to have your ideology, then no one's going to move in this part of the world, is my view. Uh, there's too much at stake for so many people. Um, and, I, you know, I'm not going to divide, but private conversations I've had, you know, 
people don't necessarily agree. And I know there's thousands out there, they're not just in the pews, they're actually in the pulpits who don't fully sign up to it, but it's just too difficult. So they're just going to muddle along. So let's give out each other a bit of grace to actually try and live better under God. And maybe those ideologies may actually take a back seat and we may get somewhere. I don't know. Thought bubble. Yeah, there's a Casting Crown song called Broken Together. And I, I love the song because it is about, uh, it's, it's a marriage song, but it's about actually we just need to be broken together. And I think there is a bit of that, Jeff, the, the extending grace to one another, realising that, yeah, any relationship is dealing with, you know, humans. <laughs> Mm. yeah and we so think we need to alongside one another and lifting one another up we also need to listen more we need to um sit when i did clinical pastoral education you know the one thing we were taught was to sit down with that person in a space where we're not offering solutions we're not offering um, ways forward all the time we're actually listening and walking the journey with them and just being with them and showing up. And that will permeate into our being as a, as a Christian community because we'll actually start to take on the responsibility. And then we'll start, that will affect change. I've got a comment that's come through now. And I think as much as I'd like to agree with Jeff, I do differ on some of my perspectives on that. And that's because I'm a, I'm a producer, right? Like I'm not privy to everything that's going on. And I think what was said in the drum a few weeks ago um, really resonated with me because it, I think the person standing at the pulpit, they, they might, you know, hopefully they're people who love Jesus, right? But they're not always aware of what they're saying and the impact that that might have to someone sitting there. So um, I think I've just, there's been such emphasis on submission um, in my part of my story of, um, you know, someone like you must be so hard to submit, Jen. If I had a dollar for every time that that was said to me, I, and so I felt defined by submission. I remember waking up one morning and saying, I know what the problem is. I'm defined by submission, which, you know, I should be. It's defined in terms of my, um, to God um, and trying to live his ways, but not to my husband. And I, Jackie Stoneman, who, um, as most of you will probably um, will know, she's just written, Complementarians say that women's submission is to be voluntary, yet if they don't submit, then they aren't obeying God. And I, I think this is, this is part of the problem, right? Like, wouldn't it be great if we could all just work together in this space? But unfortunately, those who hold a hierarchical complementarian view of this, and I, I tend not to call them complementarians. I don't tend to call myself an egalitarian. I tend to call myself a complementarian because I believe in the um, in working together, being my husband and I complement one another. Um, this is the problem, is that people who are egalitarian, for want of a better word, are told that they're not obeying God. So what do we do with that? This is poor theology. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Name it. As mm. it is. Yeah. And if Jeff's not happy with that answer, but... <laughs> To come from my perspective too, that, that's an example of coercive control. Mm -hmm. To submit is godly, but it's voluntary. No, it's not. There's already been adverse consequences put in place for not adhering to this thing that's supposedly voluntary. That's what coercive control is, to coat something in this niceness to make you think that that's a good choice, but actually you don't have a choice at all and the outcome is worse for you. That's what it is. So uh, I don't buy that line that submission is voluntary because if it was voluntary, there'd be an equally credible alternative with no adverse consequences, and there's not. We've had a couple of others. So Bryony Scott saying, yeah, no, nah, I'm not for one going to wait around, hoping people stop hitting each other. Uh, Graham Anderson, I think we have enough evidence to out the doctrine of headship as a sinful doctrine that ought to have no place in a biblical, biblically-based, Christ-focused, kingdom-shaped community. Um, we have to, um, I absolutely agree with all of you about the way we should be towards each other and the way we should express grace and 
Um, but I think often the burden is on the oppressed or the silenced to have grace. Mm -hmm. We are the ones oh, yeah. who for decades have sat in churches and, and heard those words for decades. Mm -hmm. But Jeff, the people that say to you, um, you know, I, I'm, I, who are proponents of headship or whatever, who say we all just need to work together and why is it so, I, I, I don't think very many of them would have sat for decades in churches led by women, mm -hmm. if ever, you know. Um, it's like, only people in power that say things like that. Say things like that. And, 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 and it's a power structure that depends on women being silent. And I think we have to acknowledge for people who are, who are watching today, there is a cost for re mm -hmm. rebelling in that system, which is saying, I will have a voice or I will use my gifts or I want women to be heard. That kind of, there's a real cost to that. And that's why, that's why I speak about it because I can see what's happening to other women and I can see the dangers there and I can see the pain. And um, that's not what should be in the church. And it's so telling, isn't it, that if the um, the task force weren't even allowed to address um, headship despite everything that has been said, that's concerning. And it's and that is the concerning. and that is the primary driver of the thing that they were investigating. All the evidence says that the primary driver of domestic violence is gender inequality, and yet they were kind of vetoed from investigating it. Isn't that coercive control as well? Oh, it's a pretty obvious sin of omission, I think. <laughs> right. But they were told, they were told to, that was how they had to, they were the parameters under which they were and able if, to. And yet if you ask survivors what they would want to be the parameters, guess what they'd say? Mm. They'd say gender inequality. They'd the say the voicelessness of women. They'd say male headship. That's what worries me a, a bit, quite a lot still, actually, is that those women should be on, those who are able to, there's a whole issue with an, anonymity, but some are just the media and, like, I, I, they should be on the, these task forces. Of course they the should. Councils and should be running it. They're the ones that kind of know. And if we continue to have these um, people who are one step removed, it's, you know, like that we won't kind of get to the nub of the core of the problem. Um, I have to wonder what we're afraid of, but I agree. There's just there's an absolute mountain of evidence there that, 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 that this is causing. I'm so thankful to everyone sitting here this evening with me. Thank you so much. I think what it, it's done for me is just to highlight um, the value of hearing from lots of different voices in any conversation. I've always respected um, hearing from my my old. Um, colleagues, my, uh, my brothers in Christ. And so thank you, Jeff, for that. I'm, I, a few years ago, I was like, I, I, where are the women's voices uh, on a whole range of topics? And that's part of the reason why Fixing Our Eyes launched was we wanted to hear women's perspectives. And I'm just thrilled that over the past five years or more that we've started to see groups emerge where women's voices have been given a platform and um, hearing from um, people like um, Kylie, who's an expert in her field, and Julia, who's been doing the research in this, and Angela, who's had a long history here with um, the Sydney Diocese and, um, and paved her own, carved her way despite um, all the challenges of that. And then hearing from someone um, like Jackie, Jackie, you've just struck me as someone who I just want to hear more from, um, from a platform about um, your understanding of um, God's word and um, your insights into that and gosh I wish that you were and I'm going to start crying I just wish that I had the opportunity to sit in a church and hear from you at a pulpit um, about the trinity and what you believe that um, human flourishing looks like what it means to be human um, so I'm, I'm particularly thankful to to um, to um, Lynn Kidson who was the one who suggested that you be on the panel tonight so yeah, yeah. she's great yeah. <laughs> she is she certainly is so another woman who um it's um the whole week we've just had um so many people who have been able to speak into this space it's by no means um finished um there's a lot of work to be done still but um for the fact that people all of you have been willing to be here and be part of this conversation i can't thank you enough um thanks for organizing it jen thanks jen yeah, jen you're amazing you go you <laughs> I've got a lot of good supporters.
Um, but I just wanted to finish, I guess, with, I think we're about Jesus, right? And so may we always fix our eyes on Jesus, you know, the author and perfecter of our faith. May we learn from his example. May we worship him. May we seek his voice. May we glorify him. May we be his voice, his hands and his feet to help transform this world. May we go out there. May we be the light, right? Okay, so and I'm just so conscious as every night this week and particularly tonight, um, I thank you, Jackie, for sharing your very personal and real story because um, I think the more that we hear women speaking truth about a whole range of issues, um, then the more other women will be able to say, hey, that's me and I need help. And, so and you know you. what? I'm now teaching with Jeff at St Mark's National Theological College and Systematic Theology so How good is that i oh, yeah. yeah so god can do all all things yes we, he can we walk with him and he he will take us from the ashes and create beauty that's oh heck he yes wildflowers i refer to wildflowers the first night right you know that's exactly what you are you're a wildflower that with that beauty from ashes and thank you so much again for um for this evening um yeah. God is good, right? We Absolutely. have many um, Australian Christian women that are watching and I know that there's going to be an awful lot of them whose homes are not safe and Fixing Your Eyes understands domestic and family violence to be a deeply gendered problem and complex. However, Fixing Your Eyes also recognises and stands with victims and survivors where the gender pattern differs. If you're experiencing domestic violence, call the National Sexual Assault and Domestic Violence Counselling Service on 1800 RESPECT if you're in immediate danger in your home please call triple zero if you're in Australia. And Lifeline has a 24 hour crisis line that's there to support you on 13, 11, 14. Now please find further resources on our website, fixingeyes.org and our social media platforms. And we're gonna to link to the safer resources, which is the work of Common Grace um, in this space. Um, and a particular shout out to Erica Hammonds, who's just done so much good in that space with her team. Um, as soon as I click end, I'm gonna be saying goodbye to very abruptly to my, um, these lovely, great people here alongside me. So thank you.